Good morning, everyone. Today I am happy to be back at the Ludwig von Mises Institute for the 30th Mises University. I couldn't have asked for a better year to be speaking as a faculty member for the first time at Mises U. I feel impelled to provide a semi-autobiographical digression, but I'm afraid it could seem a bit unmotivated. So I'd like to begin by properly delimiting, delimiting the main topic of our discussion today. The primary problem considered by this talk is the following. The state has no political legitimacy, and in particular, has no legitimacy to enforce tax laws by coercion. The citizen and making obedience to tax law primarily a matter of prudence and pragmatism. But do citizens, or at least libertarians, have the right to actively seek and receive uh, financial or in-kind subsidy from the state? Uh, or at the very least, have an obligation to not actively <coughs> seek and receive such subsidy? I claim that we are obligated to not actively seek and receive such subsidy, uh, despite the competitive disadvantages that may result from this. Uh, the only possible exceptions I could think of are those where state monopolization or crowding out has made it virtually impossible to conduct these activities without the subsidy, as often occurs in basic science, which I usually work in. In discussing the business challenges that me and my family have in putting ourselves at a competitive disadvantage by not accepting, in our case, farm subsidies, I claim that one can and should seek entrepreneurial opportunities to overcome these competitive disadvantages, and that I believe that those of you here today can and should seek entrepreneurial opportunities in your own lives to overcome competitive disadvantages of not receiving such sub subsidies, <coughs> and of course, to not receive such subsidies in the first place. I'd like to clarify some other things first. Uh, though on the schedule, I think this talk was titled Practical Career Advice for Young Austrians. Its topic is more appropriately described by uh, the working title that I had, uh, Moral Principles in Practice for Interdisciplinary Austro-Liberty. Austro-Libertarians. Uh, I want to challenge the audience somewhat on what I mean by Austrians, or the Austro part of Austro-Libertarian. I would go so far as to say, if this is your first time attending Mises U, then if I knew nothing else about you, uh, I would assume you are not an Austrian, or at least not yet. Uh, this week could teach you enough to be a fellow traveler or sympathizer of the Austrian school uh, by teaching you the core ideas. But unless you have read the historical masters of the school, many of their names are displayed about me here. And if you have not read from the other schools to understand their various ideas, then I don't think you could reasonably be considered to be an Austrian. And in that respect, I'm challenging you to learn more beyond this week to find out if you really are, or at least to learn the good economics that the Austrians have to offer. Then there's the matter of uh, interdisciplinary. Of course, I'm familiar with trying to use this term in grant applications. Say, oh, I'm going to combine results from this field and that field to come up with some novel result. I don't mean it in that sense or when, what one uses in an academic department. I have in mind, rather, uh, a case like mine, where one has a significant ba background in the economics of the Austrian school or in philosophy of liberty, but nevertheless goes into some field or endeavor that is not traditionally associated uh, with these fields, not going into academic economics or political science. I mean, for those who go into some field like business or science, medicine, literature, engineering, or really uh, any other manner of professional concentration. And then there's a matter of what do I mean by moral principles? The Austrian School of Economics 
although it is often associated with certain uh, policy and political philosophy views, is a positive body of thought, not a normative one. So what am I doing talking about uh, moral principles and for something that is, at least the Austrian part, is uh, about positive thought, not normative thought. Well, some of the normative principles I have in mind are those of a scholar proper, uh, not simply for adherence to the Austrian school or libertarianism, but some normative principles are related to specifically Austro-libertarian views that state intervention is destructive and immoral, and our questions primarily concern whether and to what extent Austro-libertarians should accept benefits from uh, that destructive intervention, especially in the sciences and business. So I'll tell you a, a little bit about myself, and it touches on some of these uh, interdisciplinary and other themes that we'll discuss. The story begins with my own father, uh, Hal Walter, who is a rugged individualist through and through and has always been an entrepreneur. Uh, and on my side, uh, I was a precocious child, and my father... Uh, helped encourage me in my intellectual development, which led to me ultimately graduating high school at age 14. I went on to pursue a Bachelor of Science degree in Math, Physics, and Economics at University of Arkansas, graduated at age 18. In that time, I completed significant graduate coursework in economics, uh, actually, in macroeconomic theory, statistics, and econometrics. Uh, but I had better developed research programs in math and physics, and I ultimately decided to pursue those subjects for research in graduate school. I'm now a PhD candidate in those two areas uh, and hold some competitive university and national fellowships, uh, which is to say I have benefited from the state as well, so I come across uh, some of these moral challenges of accepting subsidy from the state. Now, it might seem interesting that I went into math and physics. Why was I interested in economics in the first place? Um, well, in the first place, uh, my family, when we moved to Arkansas about 11 years ago, uh, originally from New Jersey, uh, we purchased a farm, and uh, my, I joined the Future Farmers of America, which is a very, very large youth organization in the United States. And my math skills allowed me to excel in their competitions in farm business management and agricultural economics. Uh, and I use this experience today. Uh, I'm the manager of my family's growing farm operation now. But also in my development, uh, <clears throat> of course, I had a voracious appetite for reading. My father fed me with uh, a few books, including John Flynn's As We Go Marching, about the rise of fascism. And, uh, of course, Ayn Rand, The Fountainhead, and Atlas Shrugged in particular. Uh, I actually went through a, an objectivist stage that, of course, is quite common. And while doing that, uh, I was looking around the Ayn Rand Institute's online bookstore. I saw this book, Human Action, and had this description. Uh, it was like Einstein's general theory of relativity and physics, uh, but for economics. And, and incidentally, that's an excellent comparison. So anyway, I thought, well, that sounds really interesting, but it's really expensive. So I go to Google, look up human action, Ludwig von Mises, and the Mises Institute comes up. There's, here's the book free online. Oh, here, let me start this. And I read it all the way through to the chapter on monopoly theory. That's not the most readable chapter of that book. But uh, when I did that, uh, well, I started looking around. I started looking at economy and state, and gradually with that, and eventually attending Mises uh, Institute events, I became a well-read Austrian. Um, so, so much for uh, my background. Now, for many of you, uh, this is your first time at Mises U. Uh, I had that experience in 2009. Uh, where my young age was 15, uh, my disability and my 
wide reading uh, drew some attention, uh, Ralph Rako in particular, I remember. Uh, but there was another student that year uh, in a wheelchair uh, who quite stood out to others. Uh, some of you uh, probably have never heard of them, heard of him, and some of you have forgotten him, and some of you remember him, uh, John David Fernandez. At the time uh, John David attended Mises U, he had completed his first year at Columbia University. Uh, the same institution where Walter Block and Murray Rothbard took uh, their doctoral degrees. David was a strong network for libertarian networker for libertarian outreach. Uh, he made a strong impression on many Mises U attendees and the faculty. And uh, in 2010, a scholarship was awarded in his name. Sadly, uh, David died on Saturday night, January 16th of 2010. Uh, he was 20 years old and it was less than a year after he attended Mises U for the first time. If time permitted, uh, I would dedicate more time to discussing state intervention in the realm of health and disability, which has significant consequences for me and my quality of life and certainly did for David. But those topics are for another time. So the, the reason uh, I mentioned John David Fernandez in this talk, uh, at the time, many people felt that he, and we heard a lot about this yesterday, that he channeled the spirit of Murray Rothbard. Not that John David was necessarily a polymath, but like Murray, John David was the quintessential joyous libertarian in a world that cannot appreciate the full scope of liberty. The enthusiasm of the joyous libertarian can draw many others to liberty just as uh, Murray Rothbard did, just as John David did uh, before his good character could bring about all those good acts of which he was capable. So in the time after your first year at Mises U, I implore you to be a scholar, be a networker, to be a defender of liberty, as, of course, Murray Rothbard was, as John David was in the time that he had. But we meet, need more than joy in the fight for liberty. Uh, we need principles. And for those of us entering spheres of life other than academic economics or political science, there are some distinctive moral challenges that really require uh, what Ludwig von Mises took it his, as his motto, tu ne que de malis sed contra al dentio reto. And that brings us to the main topic of my talk today. The challenge is of primary interest to us, those that give rise to choices between one's austro-libertarian principles and abandoning those principles are those challenges that arise from particular forms of social competition in various modes of social organization or institutions where the state significantly intervenes. These challenges come to center in large part on whether we should seek and accept subsidy or similar such benefits from the state to seek a more favorable position in the system of social cooperation. I'd like to quote from one of my favorite passages in Human Action on Competition. And here's, uh, here's Mises. The term competition as applied to the conditions of animal life signifies the rivalry between animals, which manifests itself in their search for food. We may call this phenomenon biological competition. Biological competition must not be confused with social competition, i.e., the striving of individuals to attain the most favorable position in the system of social cooperation. As there will always be positions which men value more highly than others, people will strive for them and try to outdo rivals. Social competition is consequently present in every conceivable mode of social organization. I would like to pause for a moment on the meaning of uh, every conceivable mode of social organization. Now, I think Mises may have meant specifically those mechanisms of social cooperation through the division of labor, like capitalism or socialism, 
interventionism, some big system like that. But I think it just as well can be applied to other social organizations or institutions such as those smaller ones that comprise modern science, universities, and particular industries. Mises goes on to say that an individuals in a free society without ambition or social competition behave like the stud horses which do not try to put themselves in a favorable light when the owner picks out the stallion to impregnate his best brood mare. But such people would no longer be acting men. I should mention that modern economists don't write like this. But um, Mises uh, then goes on to make a step toward comparative political economy. In a totalitarian system, social competition manifests itself in the endeavors to court the favor of people to court the favor of those in power. In the market economy, competition manifests itself in the fact that the sellers must outdo one another by offering better or cheaper goods and services, and that buyers must outdo one another by offering higher prices. Now, my main example uh, can interventionist society, which combines elements of courting the favor of those in power, as well as profit and loss. If time permitted, uh, I would discuss social competition in the realm of modern science and universities. And on that subject, um, Jeff Deist uh, hinted at this in some detail, and ultimately uh, I chose to focus on different things in this talk. Uh, but there are notable parallel challenges in the lives of Ludwig von Mises and his famous brother, the applied mathematician uh, Richard von Mises, both of which relate to perverse instances of social competition. Of course, these take place under the Nazi regime or in connection with the Nazi regime, uh, so they are admittedly extreme examples, uh, but very instructive ones. Um, so I refer you to my talk from AERC 2014 on the ideas of Ludwig von Mises in the context of mathematics under the Nazis. Uh, and of course, you're welcome to ask me any questions you'd like about that. Now, the intrusion of ideology through the state in contemporary science is much less overt, uh, with notable exceptions, of course. Uh, the state influence on science comes primarily in the form of uh, financial support uh, of various funding agencies, such as the National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, and of course, many military contractors, the, uh, in the, the case of the US, National Institutes of Health, and so on. Uh, now, Dr. William Butos was uh, here earlier this week, and I don't know if he's still here, uh, is an expert on the topic of government-funded versus privately-funded science, and the nature of crowding out of basic science uh, by the government. Uh, and I defer in large part to his knowledge uh, of the subject. Of course, it's always been difficult for me to reconcile my Austro-Libertarian ideals with the government funding I've received, uh, even if the awarding of these, those scientific grants is largely meritocratic. It's not really a problem of the abilities of science so much as it's a problem of uh, whether those abilities are directed toward the most important end. Without the profit and loss uh, in many instances of science, it's hard to determine. Uh, but I won't dwell on those distinctive moral challenges uh, for libertarian scientists in accepting the support of these agencies. The funding of basic science uh, is an instance in which crowding out often occurs to such a significant extent, libertarians are often left to support, uh, to accept that support if they are going to engage in those activities. As it turns out, uh, at least two thirds of research, you know, R&D research is done uh, in, in private business, but um, in the case of basic science, it flips about two thirds comes from the government, at least in universities. Uh, perhaps the best models uh, on this question are Eugen von von Bewerk and Ludwig von Mises, uh, who in their capacities as government advisors, uh, try to bring rationality to the conduct of the policy of their agencies. 
But now I'd like to consider my main example of perverse social competition under interventionism uh, based on my own experience from agricultural business. Uh, so my family uh, owns and operates Briar Creek Ranch, which consists of about 500 acres in uh, Clark Ridge, Arkansas, an unincorporated township in northern uh, Baxter County, Arkansas. It's about a 550 mile drive from here to there. Uh, we're primarily a cow-calf pair commercial cattle operation, uh, but we also produce uh, hay and forage for our own use and occasionally sell to others. Uh, this began with our initial purchase of 165 acres uh, at like, 11 years ago when we moved, uh, and we have expanded significantly since. In the last two years, the farm has entered its own as a viable business venture. Now, I should mention here that uh, historically, farming has received a preferred status as a tax shelter. It's greater exposure to weather related and other risks has often been used to justify deductions for investment in farming, the idea being to compensate for that increased risk and increase the willingness of uh, lenders to put up capital for farming operations. But in contrast to general accounting rules that generally require deferral of capitalization uh, <clears throat> of expenses incurred in connection with products which only yield income in future years, Farmers uh, may accelerate deductions such that this may be taken out of current income. Uh, among other things, this encourages cash basis accounting, despite that accrual basis accounting may in fact be a more accurate reflection of capital because it includes inventory, which can be quite significant in farming operations. Uh, farmers also receive preferential options on deducting now or capitalizing later. Uh, for certain things, uh, which can even give the appearance of an operating loss despite making an economic gain. And this is particularly helpful for reducing tax liability on income earned outside of farming. And in some cases, deferred tax liability may often be converted into capital gains uh, in the case that capital gains are taxed at a lower rate. Incidentally, if Hillary Clinton is elected president of the US, that probably would be more difficult. Uh, which is a bit strange because farmers are a major supporter of hers. But anyway, the point, uh, uh, some of the point of this is a lot of what happens in what we call farms are actually, they're not business ventures in the normal sense that are directed toward maximizing uh, profit. They are actually based in loss aversion to the paying of taxes uh, and not being based on profit and loss, they're more it has a more bureaucratic nature uh, than uh, business nature. Now, Ludwig von Mises and sociologist uh, Max Weber, incidentally, if you want to be an Austrian, you should also read Max Weber, uh, at the very least, to put the ideas in context. But as they pointed out, farmers have always been poor to adopt rational economic calculation, and those traditions of sound accounting uh, that emerged spontaneously with the rise of capitalism. Uh, I am suggesting that inconsistent tax interventions <clears throat> have uh, further bastardized problematic uh, economic calculation among farmers. And I think it has proliferated uh, various farm operations in our area uh, that, again, are not businesses in the normal profit-maximizing sense. You have various weekend warrior farmers uh, <clears throat> who raise a few cattle here and there, and of course, hold land and buy various inputs. What they end up doing is bidding up land prices in the area. Uh, they flood local markets with generally lower grade livestock, and more on that in a little bit. And they tend to involve themselves in land disputes. A familiar case of disputes due to uh, in inconsistent land title. Uh, also, there are people that are more affluent, uh, people that are not farmers in the professional sense. They're interested in the tax implications and, again, put further pressure on these various inputs. Uh, but then there are also more professional farmers, and they're really our main concern uh, in this talk. We'll visit this in a little bit. 
Uh, these professional farmers realize the same preferential tax treatment. And uh, morally, I have no issue uh, with accepting uh, these tax breaks and, or, for that matter, their existence, despite what uh, pernicious effects some of this intervention may have. Uh, because the state has no legitimacy and, in particular, has no right to enforce tax laws by coercion, if taxation is theft, then I think we're right to accept Rothbard's view that we should favor preserving existing tax breaks and use them to the fullest extent. It's defensive to try to keep our earnings, of course. As I said, it's a matter of prudence. It, it would be unwise to be a fool uh, to bring the tax authorities, uh, to bring them after you. Uh, but the more professional farmers in our area and to a substantially greater extent in other areas, not only avoid taxes, uh, not so much evade them, uh, they accept state subsidies well. And before discussing the morality of accepting subsidy, let's consider the magnitude. So, um, our county, Baxter County, Arkansas. Now, these data here are based on U.S. Department of Agriculture numbers uh, that were obtained by Freedom of Information Act request by uh, an organization called the Environmental Working Group. Now, as it turns out, they're more of a left-leaning organization, you know, believing very pseudo, some pseudo-scientific things with organic farming and anti-GMO stuff, but their anti-corporate elements make them very good at gathering um, data. And this is, they have a very nice database that I encourage you to look up if you live within the U.S. It would certainly be worth looking at to see what farmers are taking uh, in your area. You may even know people in the database. So, in our county, 7.08 million in subsidies over a 20-year period uh, from 1995 to 2014. I don't have um, <clears throat> 2015 numbers. And now, if you look through the list of various federal uh, agriculture programs, uh, it's, it's like a devil's resume. It, it, and I couldn't possibly go through the details of all those various programs. So I'm just going to show you. Uh, so disaster, so-called disaster programs are the majority in our area, and there's conservation programs. You can see something about our area that things traditionally associated with producing uh, major <clears throat> ag commodities, other than livestock, uh, receive very little. So <clears throat> we'll actually see that this county doesn't take that much in resources. Uh, I'll show you a little bit of things in our area. Uh, now these numbers are broken down a little bit. These things don't all add up to the 7.08 million because you'll see already this exceeds it. Uh, <clears throat> they fall under a few different things. It's really these first three in our area uh, and really disaster payments and livestock subsidies. As it turns out, most of these things called disaster payments are associated with livestock is supposed to be for lost forages or something like that. It's things that you can, of course, self-insure for by <clears throat> accumulating forages, accumulating hay, and that's just for our case. Uh, <clears throat> people will take on riskier behavior of the existence of these programs. Uh, also, <clears throat> the considerable overlap accounts for why it's a similar number of recipients in these various programs. Uh, these things are tied to various political processes and of course these aren't inflation adjusted numbers but that doesn't account for all of the changes here. So this is just within our own area uh, with this is with disaster payments. These tend to correspond to various farm bill appropriations and in fact some of the disaster relief was cut off for uh, after 2011 and with the signing of the 2014 farm bill there is a very <laughs> significant increase in the allotment of these programs uh, you can see the livestock disaster emergency as i was telling you these miscellaneous disaster payments correspond to things like a 
fence damage, which uh, in a lot of these cases, again, is part of a proper fence maintenance program. This is something that <clears throat> is not, many of these things are not actually insurable events. And I can tell you from these particular cases, this is not a case of, you know, systemic weather related damage uh, throughout one's property. It's smaller things that could have been handled at one time and were allowed to develop and become worse. Uh, these things, of course, these livestock subsidies are very tied to the other ones, so I won't really focus on them <coughs> so much. Um, and as so I was saying, there's considerable overlap in what these programs are, uh, but <coughs> these are very disaster things. Livestock forage is for emergency livestock feed livestock emergency assistance. Uh, and these other ones, I think, are for different type of losses. But uh, there is at least one bad year as weather goes. But again, if you're accumulating enough <clears throat> forage to handle a bad year, then you shouldn't need these things. But this money is there. Uh, you can even get information on particular recipients. Now, I'm not going to be a muckraker. I'm not going to go through and show you how much all of these various individuals took. Uh, but I can give you the example of the top recipient. This is just for livestock. This is livestock subsidies here. Uh, and let's say we take the top recipient. Uh, 160,000 livestock subsidies over a 20-year period. Okay. Uh, now, if you take the last year, and this is for the totals, so... This number doesn't correspond to this one, but you see the sudden increase. Roughly one third of this individual's total <coughs> uh, subsidy payments is all from 2014. And again, I don't have 2015 uh, numbers, so you can't see how this behavior continues. Uh, and I won't focus on this one. <coughs> These are there's environmental programs, and you can see that not so much of this comes from recently. Um, then, actually, I should put this in perspective. So, a few months ago, I attended some event, uh, a young farmer and ranchers conference. So, there are farmers from all around the state of Arkansas. And I went down there, and it was notable, we were the only people from Baxter County at this event. There were, uh, you know, you're going through the line for food, and if you don't get any rice on your plate, one of these uh, rice farmers looks at you funny and, and why are you not getting any, any rice? And I think we even said something about, oh, think of the subsidies that you take. So you look at this, in the case of the, uh, <clears throat> you know, those people are buying various other inputs that we're buying in the area too. So this is interesting uh, when you look at how congressional districts are broken up in Arkansas. I don't have a map here of Arkansas, but some of these other ones uh, that take substantially less, these are all weird things. This is in Northwest Ark, or, yeah, I think that one's, which one is? There's a lot of weird shaped states, but this district uh, you know, took $8 billion in USDA subsidies over a 20-year period. We are actually in this district, and I showed you we're only 7.08 million uh, over a 20-year period. So this is obviously dwarfed. What happens is you go across the top. We're in the district. Uh, let's say the state of Arkansas is a square. You go to the t middle on the top. This is Baxter County. You go over here. The district goes all the way here, and then all the way down the Mississippi River, including the whole Delta region. There's a lot of rice farming. So <laughs> obviously we're dwarfed by this. Um, so when you look at Arkansas over a 20 year period, uh, this is not in proportion to total land area and uh, population. This is 11.5 billion subsidies over a 20 year period for farmers. You see in this case, it's much different when we saw commodity programs, crop insurance subsidies in particular. These are indicators of <clears throat> production of other very prominent commodities like rice. Arkansas itself produces a very large amount of rice. Disaster programs and conservation programs are much smaller. This is nine of 50 states. Now, interesting, 77% of farms in Arkansas do not collect subsidy payments. Uh, of course, some of these aren't serious professional farms, but 
there are people not take, you know, but these people have a very obvious competitive advantage. And this just shows you uh, rice, cotton, soybeans, wheat are a big recipients of these, and then some other things we can often see. Uh, if you look at state, on a statewide basis in the U.S., everything's bigger in Texas. Let me take the top. Uh, and then, of course, the entire Corn Belt uh, uh, takes up. And then uh, Arkansas comes in here. Uh, you don't see California on this list. It's sort of an interesting thing. And then Missouri, which is a bordering state, so on. Now, just in the top 10 recipient states, 58% over that 20-year period goes to these. So... Three hundred twenty-two billion uh, overall over that twenty-year period. Now, this is smaller than what some other industries receive, but this is substantial given everything you hear about farmers. And I believe that's the last of those slides. So that was just to give you a feel for some of the data. Uh, now, so there is competition already for receiving uh, these subsidies in the agricultural bureaucracy and legislatures. Uh, there's the usual public choice considerations by which these subsidies are distributed according to effective lobbying. Uh, then there's competition within the disbursement of the funds themselves. So on the local level, you get this sign up now, sign up now mentality. And the idea is, uh, at least with respect to some of these programs, uh, the late joiners are the last in line to receive uh, these funds. Uh, and in particular, if funds run out, uh, then uh, those people late, that joined late uh, will not receive funding. I don't know how often that actually happens, uh, but that's not so much the point. It's uh, actually very similar to sort of tragedy of the commons, uh, and in some respects to what it is. Uh, but there's also competition on the markets on which these subsidy recipients buy inputs and sell outputs. And... Then there are very significant cases of regulatory capture in agriculture. I'm not going to go through that now. <laughs> in the case of major agricultural commodities, and we saw some of this already, uh, rice, cotton, soybeans, wheat, sorghum, corn, and sugar, commodity payments and crop insurance are tied to volume of production and average yield, which is tied to various economies of scale. Of course, larger operations have advantages there. <laughs> These uh, new competition uh, <clears throat> will tend to increase land prices, cost of credit, uh, and uh, the cost of very non-specific inputs <clears throat> that uh, are needed to engage in agriculture. It could be purchasing of agricultural equipment or even getting repairs done uh, by local vendors. <clears throat> and this tends to make it harder for uh, smaller entrants, in particular younger farmers, is why in agriculture there's this amazing emphasis to recruit younger farmers. Um, a lot of it derives from these interventions. <clears throat> and where my family lives, uh, these subsidy recipients also gain advantage with respect to not only the buying of land and doing business with local vendors, it also increases their sales in uh, local livestock auctions and private sales. And my family is yet to directly benefit from receiving this subsidy, but it's extremely tempting. <clears throat> of course, you know, if you talk to our friend Walter Block, why not take the money? It's been argued by others that we should try to starve the beast by accepting financial support of the state. The idea being, uh, by accepting the state support, we accelerate its demise. This strikes me as a remarkably convenient. Uh, I believe it underestimates the stability of interventionism. If it leads in to socialism, it takes a very long time. Uh, at best, I think the starving argument perhaps would apply to trying to accelerate the collapse of social security or socialized medicine. And it's not clear to me that forwards libertarian goals because what would the response be when those programs collapse? could be <clears throat> worse than what we have. Another argument uh, is that accepting state subsidy is actually reclaiming stolen goods, uh, which in the modern case would happen in fungible monetary terms. Uh, first, uh, I don't know if anyone really 
<clears throat> points this out, at least not in this fashion. There's an economic calculation problem uh, figuring out how much one has benefited financially uh, from the state. And I really have in mind those cases where the state has either crowded out um, private alternatives or has utterly monopolized something, as in the case with security or for, the, for roads. <clears throat> and then the matter of many governments are indeed insolvent. <clears throat> and this gives, produces a problem. How do you say uh, who's stolen goods are you reclaiming? <clears throat> It's, you can't assign it. <clears throat> and even if one takes out no more than one has paid in taxes <clears throat> or state monopolized uh, services, you don't know whose goods they are. Now, there are more sophisticated arguments, and uh, we're not going to present a sophisticated moral theory here. This is to open up <clears throat> conversation. <clears throat> And, you know, in my view, accepting subsidy ends up reducing to, for at least for private business, reduces to, to receiving stolen goods. So how does one overcome the competitive disadvantages of not directly receiving state subsidy? Most, the most moral choice would be to judge entrepreneurial profit opportunities to overcome those disadvantages. Uh, I'll give a very particular example of such an opportunity that applies to my family's farm business. The point is to identify such entrepreneurial profit opportunities in your particular cases. Now, our op entrepreneurial opportunity for increased profit <clears throat> to overcome these competitive disadvantages of not accepting subsidies consists in an institutional organizational innovation. Remember, of course, that in the dynamical market process, one mo must always seek new profit opportunities. In fact, by even telling you this, I probably forces us to have to seek even more profit opportunities. Now, in our case, uh, this is this com this <clears throat> organizational innovation comes from marketing our cattle through uh, something called the Integrity Beef Alliance, based out of Oklahoma. Now, to understand that, this, I'm going to tell you very briefly about something with the market structure with commercial beef cattle. Uh, unlike some other livestock production, uh, the breeding and early stages of uh, <clears throat> cattle production are very wide. It's a very decentralized market. A lot of smaller producers uh, bearing the substantial risk of the actual breeding that happens. <clears throat> and one tends to sell these into a larger market. And often these animals will go to, at least in the case of where the animals except for animals that go directly to slaughter. In many cases, uh, these animals are going to backgrounding facilities that prepare <clears throat> these animals before they go to feedlots. And then they go to the centralized feeding operations and centralized processing facilities. <clears throat> but in the local markets, uh, you have what have people in market failure call uh, information asymmetry. <clears throat> Uh, in the case of most auctions, the only thing you have to go by is some external characteristic of the animal. Uh, most cases, uh, it reduces to going by the color of the animal. Um, <clears throat> that you know, the animal is black. Uh, there's often an assumption that it's Angus, which has a, <clears throat> which is more likely to have a higher grade meat, so it tends to command higher prices. White animals uh, tend to be associated with. <clears throat> Charlet breeds, which put on a lot of meat, which increases the output, but tends to not be as high of a grade. And then there are traits that are perhaps make animals very efficient for our area to have, you know, Brahmin, Indian <clears throat> sort of traits, but uh, don't have as good of a meat. And if there are any sign of those traits, one tends to get docked for it. Um, but in many cases, uh, these animals aren't that. Uh, in, you could have some things registered, but that doesn't command much in our area. <clears throat> so in this, the case of this organization, it comes through a trade organization called the Noble Foundation. As far as I know, uh, this doesn't seem like a cartelization device. It's a nonprofit entity, and it's not a lobbying organization, at least not yet. 
For now, it seems to me analogous to those stock exchanges that spontaneously arose in the Netherlands in the 1600s. <clears throat> or for that matter, uh, various stock exchanges in the US. It ends up providing certification like a uh, underwriter's laboratory. You'll hear, if you talk to Mark Thornton about this, he could have a lot to tell you about underwriter's laboratory. You'll see their certification on various products that lets you know they've tested it to see if it's a good product. And on that basis, one can realize a price premium for your product. So what they're doing in this case is they're taking <clears throat> only uh, registered uh, <clears throat> Angus or registered Charlet, and to be part of the program to receive the certification, you have to go through their own process, their own people, check the animals to make sure that they're <clears throat> free of disease, and so on. And also they have an extensive network that one can use to realize a market premium. <clears throat> and this is one mechanism, of course, as I said, Eventually, even those people that benefit from subsidies in our area, if they find out about this, or this becomes more widespread, then they'll realize the same benefit, which leaves us needing to find another profit opportunity. I'm already a little over time, so it's a good time to conclude. In my call for Austro libertarians to be joyous and to uphold libertarian principles informed by economics and tr the tradition of the Austrian school, I have presented a rather tough challenge except in those instances where state crowding out or monopolization has made it utterly impossible to go without subsidy to continue conducting some activity that would likely still happen uh, absent that government intervention. <clears throat> except in those cases, a libertarian is obligated to not accept state subsidy and to seek entrepreneurial opportunities to overcome the competitive disadvantages of that moral stance. And my father and family and I struggled with this, challenges, with this challenge for uh, several years now. <clears throat> and it's a matter, if you are going to accept those subsidies in the case of business, you have to be honest with yourself. <clears throat> As a friend put it to uh, my dad a few years ago, it's a matter of integrity. And thank you very much.